Longhorn family and friends. We are happy to have all of you joining us tonight for our final scheduled presentation of Being Black in America. Tonight's focus is on race and athletics. And we had a phenomenal moderator and a robust panel of former UT athletes. My name, in case you don't know, is Evelyn Brothers. I attended UT from 1996 to 2000, where I earned a BA in psychology. After moving to Dallas, I obtained, I obtained my MBA from the University of Texas at Dallas. I am joined by my co-host and friend and spiritual counselor, Shaniqua Risher, and we will be tag teaming this, this evening um, throughout the duration of, of our, our series. Our moderator and panelists will engage in discussion for, I'd say, give or take 60 minutes, you know, depending on how, how good the dialogue is. It may uh, go over a little bit more, but uh, on schedule, 60 minutes. After that time, we will open the floor for questions. Uh, we do want dialogue from all of you and uh, communication and, uh, you know, just just partnering to figure out how to, to maneuver in, in, in this new world and old world. So feel free to post questions throughout the discussion via the Zoom chat option. Um, but also we are Facebook on, on Facebook Live. So we will be monitoring Facebook Live. Please post your questions there, your comments, and we will be capturing those from there. And uh, at the end of the session, we, we will uh, distribute those to the panelists. Tamika Sattler, she will be closing out and enjoying our segment this evening. Uh, so I think without further ado, Shaniqua and I will get started with introducing our special guest this evening. Again, our moderator is Mr. Ivan Wagner. Ivan is a San Antonio, uh, that's hashtag 210. Uh, native, based in Austin, and father to a beautiful daughter. Uh, his passion for sports and athleticism opened the door for enriching experiences that have paved the way for his success on and off the field. He attended North Carolina State his freshman year before transferring to the University of Texas at Austin his sophomore year in spring 97, and I think we can all agree that that transfer was the best thing for, for all of us. Uh, he was on full scholarship with the University of Texas uh, at Austin. And while at UT, he participated in not only track, but uh, basketball as well. And winning numerous accolades and championships. Uh, just a tidbit on Ivan, he was the only individual Title I by a Texas athlete um, at a meet and was the Horns' first NCAA outdoor high jump title since James Lott in 1986. Big deal. Um, Ivan graduated UT in 2000 with the BA in sports management and immediately began his career in event management, contract food services. And for the past 20 years, it, it doesn't seem that long, but for the past 20 years, he has operated various professional and collegiate arenas, stadiums and festivals. Currently he is the regional operations director for Ryan Sanders Sports Services. We are very happy to have Ivan Wagner with us here today. Uh, he's so modest that, that, you know, this is not quite the form that he's accustomed to. Normally he's in the background, but we, we asked him to take the forefront and, and he did that at our request. So Ivan, thank you so much for being our moderator this evening. 
I will move on to our first panelist, uh, Vanessa Wallace. Vanessa Wallace is all, was on the women's basketball team. She played in 107 games with 71 stars for the Longhorns from 95 to 99. She led Texas in assists in back-to-back -back seasons in 96 and 97, and 97 and 98 as well. And the 33.3 minutes per game she averaged in 97 to 98 ranks eighth on Texas single season list. Pretty phenomenal. Uh, Wallace earned all conference honors her freshman, sophomore, and junior year. In 2016, Vanessa Wallace was inducted into the Hearst Euless Bedford, for those of us in North Texas, we refer to that as AGB, Sports Hall of Fame, which honors the individuals and teams who have excelled in athletic endeavors and have positively impacted their community by recognizing their accomplishments and celebrating their successes. A native of Euless, Texas, and a graduate of Trinity High School, Wallace earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Corporate Communications and Business Foundations from the University of Texas in 1999. Wallace, who currently resides in Portland, has been employed by Nike since the summer of 2005 and currently serves as North America Brand Director of the Jordan brand. So Vanessa, we are most pleased and most honored to not only have you as an alumni, but to have you on our panel this evening. I will now turn it over to my co-host, Janika Risher, who will introduce the other phenomenal panelists that we have with us this evening. Thank you so much, Ev. Uh, for that wonderful introduction of our esteemed panelists. Let me go ahead and move forward with our remaining three, um, but just a brief introduction of myself. Shaniqua Risher, I am a UT graduate from 1998. I graduated with a BA in government. And from there, I went to Dallas Baptist University and finished with a master's in Christian education. So let's go ahead and move forward to our next panelist, which will be Octavius Bishop. Dr. Bishop is currently the marriage and family pastor at Life Austin Church and associate adjunct psychology professor at Austin Community College in Austin, Texas. He's a frequent guest of the popular sports radio 104.9 The Horn with personality Colonel Craig Flowers. Octavius is a lifetime Longhorn where he was a four-year letterman from 1994 through 1998 a three-year starter and all Big 12 conference performer and also played four years of professional football. Octavius has a bachelor's of social work, a master's of social work, and a PhD in psychology. His professional focus is targeted towards mental health needs and issues of identity foreclosure. A believer of family first above all else, he and his wife Elizabeth are raising three beautiful children Anderson, Tatum, and Quinn. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, uh, Octavius, Dr. Bishop. Uh, our next panelist is Nick Redwine. Nick was born and raised in Tyler, Texas, where he excelled in academics in a variety of sports, which earned him a full athletic scholarship at the University of Texas at Austin. During his tenure, he was part of several championship football teams while being equally successful in academic endeavors where he majored in communications and minored in business foundations. After graduation, Nick went on to pursue a diverse career path, which included industries such as retail, insurance, leadership development, and currently technology consultant. He currently resides in Round Rock, Texas with his wife, Brittany, and two daughters, Kennedy and Charlie. Thank you so much, Nick, for being here. We appreciate you accepting the invitation. And rounding out our phenomenal list of panelists, we have Ms. Shalonda Goodman. Shalonda was an All-American student athlete on the track and field team from 2009 to 2013. She competed at the 2012 Olympic trials in the 100 and 200 meters and was a semifinalist in the 200 meters. In 2019, she was inducted into the Georgia Track and Field Hall of Fame in recognition of her stellar athletic career. 
after graduating with honors from the McComb McCombs School of Business in 2013 with a BBA in marketing. She began her career at Texas Instruments in her current role as a digital marketing manager. There she manages the development and executions of worldwide digital marketing programs. Shalanda is a firm believer of pursuing all of your passions. She is currently training with the goal of representing Team USA at the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. Thank you so much, Shalanda, for joining us. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Ivan Wagner. Thank you so much again, panelists, for being for us this evening and enjoy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Shaniqua. Um, before we uh, get going, I want to say, uh, you know, good evening to the uh, Facebook Live uh, audience. Good evening to the Zoom audience. Um, on behalf of myself and our panel, I'd like to say welcome. I'd like to say thank you for attending. Uh, we are both ecstatic and um, honored to be a part of the conversation. Uh, we are at the caboose for what has been um, We'd like to extend our thank you to Tamika, Shaniqua, and Evelyn for uh, their vision and their initiative, as well as give a big shout out and a big thank you to Best for providing um, a platform that we could speak on important issues such as mental health, uh, economics, and inequality, inequality uh, within our community. Um, our discussion for tonight will be race and athletics. There'll be a slight deviation from the prior three, but yes, sport has always been and always will be um, a very uh, an enormous uh, part of our, our culture and our community. Um, you know, sports is, is widely renowned as, as entertainment. Um, we, we very rarely see sports as something that should be heavy or something that should be dark. Um, but as a black athlete, um, one who garners uh, support from a myriad of fans, institutions, and corporations, um, we are often I guess, expected to be neutral on social issues. Um, we're told to shut up and dribble. We're told to shut up and run. Um, we're told to shut up and do whatever that it is that you do. Um, but most importantly, shut up while you're doing it. Uh, we've not always complied uh, to that directive. And thus, in our athletic history, we've had some of our more prominent athletes uh, become the willing leaders of a civil rights movement uh, we've also had some who were a little hesitant and reluctant to be a loud voice for um, social causes. But today's athlete uh, speaks loudly uh, and, and, and quite often on a, a, a multiple issues. And so the question that I want to start off with uh, for the panel, and, and actually Octavius, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the baton to be my scratch leg and run this relay, <laughs> is what do you, what do you believe um, to be the major difference in, in these eras of athletes. <laughs> Ivan, it's so good to see you, man. Um, so so yes, thank you everybody once again on here. Thank you for joining. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited to be on here with a bunch of Longhorns and also a bunch of really good uh, Black people. <laughs> so um, there, is, there are differences, you know, and, and in order to, for me to truly answer that question, I need to give a little context into my own experience, right? What I, what, how I uh, see it. I come from a, uh, a very, from very humble, humbling beginnings, meaning I, I was not even, I didn't have a home phone to be recruited on. I was recruit, recruited by every, by every school in this country on a pay phone, okay? So right there, it gives you an idea of the difference uh, between this athlete uh, and my experience in 1994 um, during, the, during the early 90s when I was in high school before I got to school uh, at the University of Texas. So there are a few di differences. Uh, one of the difference I, differences I, I recognize is, you know, this athlete is way more informed, way more informed. They have um, a, a, a plethora of ways to stay informed. We have a 24-hour news cycle, right? Uh, they're able to get information. They have tons of information. Even as a professor, I recognize that this generation is more informed than even the generation that, 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 was, that was before them in 2010, right? Uh, they are more informed uh, than, than those who came before them. So this is a really, this is a really good thing. Um, another thing I, I find, though, they are very um, 
uh, it, it, they have a lot of individualization, in my in my opinion. Uh, I think uh, that's the paramount characteristic of uh, of this uh, of this group. The, the the unique thing about this, and the good thing is, is they see the uniqueness in individuals. I think that's really neat. That is vastly different from my experience. I, it's taken me a lifetime to recognize and, and appreciate the qualities of uniqueness in other people. Uh, when I came to school at the University of Texas, I, for, I sh for sure was limited in my scope, which meant if you play football, that's who I was around. And now when I look back at my experience and, and I, then I, I, I compare that to what I see with these athletes, wow, man, they see, they see things on the horizon. I was laser focused on playing in the NFL. You get it? They have a much broader, they're more informed, they're more educated. Th that's not necessarily bad. I'm not necessarily speaking bad to myself. I'm a very loyal person, but I believe my lens was much smaller, which means I, I, um, I, I valued the bubble which I was in. I think that was to a detriment of me, to be honest with you. And it's taken me a long time, my entire career, to truly understand the uniqueness of other people. Nick, you want to tackle that? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, I agree uh, with a lot of those uh, same sentiments as, as Octavius uh, mentioned. Um, we're in the era of information technology, right? And so um, the information is, is there. It's at um, a lot of these athletes' hands, or just our hands in general. Um, if you want to go, if you want to get some information uh, and be educated on something, there's you know, many platforms to do so. Um, I even think about uh, the platform in which uh, a lot of these athletes have just in being able to market themselves and to pretty much have their um, their brand out there and what they stand for. And so a lot of people, um, a lot of individuals who revere them or at least follow them um, can understand where their, where their position is and where it lies. And so the more popular um, that becomes um, as, as they speak out, as they um, are educated and knowledgeable about their history, um, they have a better understanding and a better appreciation of self. Um, and once you have that, and just like Octavius, it took me, <laughs> took me a while to just uh, kind of come into, to come into that um, aspect of my life where I really kind of understood my, my history. I understood at a broader scope, the things that were going on, going on around me. And it really changed my outlook and my, and I feel like my trajectory uh, in life. And so uh, I, I see it as a, as an extremely positive thing um, in terms of being able to have it access. And um, from there, as, 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 as I mentioned before, there, there's a confidence, there's an element of confidence that comes along with that. How about you, Vanessa? Yeah, no, I think uh, both Nick and Octavius hit a couple points that I would 100% agree with. I think when you think about, sorry, that's interesting. When you think about, um, you know, this era of athlete, they're not only the most digitally connected ever, but they're also just socially and consciously aware. And if you think about what they've endured in their 20 years between this presidency to seeing their first black president, to also thinking about things that have happened in their lifetime, the Me Too movement or gender equality, pay equality, I just think, as everyone has said, they're so much more conscious of what's happening in the world around them, not just about being an athlete. And I think they also have different role models who've, who've also uh, emulated that when you start to think about some of the professional athletes who've taken stance in the last two to five years about what they mean, what it means to be black in America and what it means to be black in America as an athlete. And I think it's interesting. Um, the, the only thing I would say is like, what was interesting too for me growing up is I was aware of my blackness super early on. And I think it was because of, um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and then we moved to like HEB area, which we were like everyone's first black friend, right? And so it was one of those situations where in the fifth grade, I was very much aware that I was different than everyone around me and um, how people started to either act or treat you or not. 
And so I think that while it was subconsciously a part of what I identified with, it wasn't anything that I knew how to express and expressly take a stance at. But I think in contrast to what kids, not just to say kids, but what athletes and young athletes are experiencing right now, there's an openness around that um, behavior to express themselves. So it's exciting. And I also would say I'm, I'm really thoroughly impressed by them and the platforms that, and the choices that they're making to take a stance and speak on. Shalana, what do you what do you believe to be the difference between those eras of athletes? I was going to say the representation of black athletes across a variety of sports has increased um, on top of just their level of influence has significantly increased as well when Nick talked about their brand. So now they have a greater level of influence to go along with that. I um, mean, also. Um, there's so many platforms for us at our disposal that we can use to amplify and speak out on these social injustices um, and just utilize a level of influence on those various platforms, which didn't exist then. So I'll say those are our main differences. The representation across a variety of sports has increased. Um, the level of influence has increased significantly. And then we have so many platforms to our disposal for us to speak out. Okay. So, so it sounds like everyone agrees agrees that the advent of the internet, the advent of social media and, and the, the various platforms is the, the largest difference uh, between the eras of athletes. And so with that being the case and everyone having a platform, right, to, to yell out as loudly as they, they want, um, you know, back when, um, we, if, we've been, if we're being honest, we only wanted to hear from a certain few, right? And so now not only does LeBron James have a voice, Right. Not only does Allison Felix have a voice, not only does Maya Moore have a voice, but the lesser known athlete also has a voice. And so we're all um, yelling and, and from cross sectional areas. Uh, and sometimes those 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 messages don't always uh, sink and line up. And so it boasts the question, Vanessa, um, what is the role of the black athlete? Right. Uh, what do we as a community expect from from the black black athlete? Is it the responsibility of that black athlete to to be an activist. Yeah, I think that's a that's a deep question, right? And I, I feel like obviously my opinion, but I, I think it I can't answer that without saying the role of the black family and, and what that has meant to society and the fact of what we see in so many communities is how the um, taking away black men and the, the images of black men that some individuals have in their homes and in their, um, in their lives, every day um, there's challenges with that, right? And so then for all of us, we all have role models and people that we looked up to. I think in nowadays, um, those factors play into who we look after. And I also would say there was a difference now uh, in my era of, the, of those activists and community activists more traditionally who did things, whether it was Jesse Jackson, et cetera. And I think, now, with the, and I think it goes back to question number one, with the fact of us not having as many, or there being so many more platforms and so much influence in the world, that of course, athletes are going to be put on this stage. And those are the people who are making the biggest difference in the gap, um, the wealth gap, sorry. And so if you think about the role that they play in our everyday life, then of course, we're going to look to them to make sure that they're also, you know, informing their community around it. But I say that that's a task that some athletes immediately take on and understand the importance of it and understand their communities and what they truly need. And then I think there's some others who grow into that, right? And they grow into that opportunity that they don't want to put that weight on their shoulders. But I think just like all of us, we feel compelled that for the Black community to continue to evolve and grow and to get better, it'll not only take us individually doing what we need to do in our respective areas to make that impact, but also us not being um, afraid to call people out and, co and hold people accountable. And, that, and I feel like that's the platform that some of these larger athletes can do at a scale that everyone can appreciate and understand. Absolutely. Uh, so you, you took the angle of the, the family and what, the, what, the, what the, um, the gap that's being filled by the athlete. Uh, Big O, what do you, what do you think uh, uh, about that premise? Oh, I, I, I agree with, um... It, Vanessa on that she said that very well I I look at it from uh, from from two worlds right from uh, the, the the white majority uh, I believe 
believes that that most I believe believes that blacks probably should play, you know, should play the sport. And I hear I hear just play, um, play the sport, stay out of way, stay out of the you know the news. Um, and on the flip side, um, the black my blackness and my black community, uh, they need an advocate, and athletes are advocates. Yeah. Um, we you know we we are not the majority in this country. So at the end of the day, um, when you're an athlete on 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 the on, on the center stage, I can see why uh, we look to our athletes to be advocates. Um, and when when I'm think about what what you're saying, this kind of this kind of relates. Um, you know, when I was in the, you we were in high school, Ivan, in in, in the '90s. Well, mm-hmm. think about think the person who, who was the most prominent athlete, Michael Jordan. He wasn't saying anything. He wasn't saying anything. So if we were like modeling something, we were mo- we, we saw that wow he got he had a lot of success by staying under the under the fold, right? And um, I'm just being honest. You know, we, we look to uh, look to athletes because we look to other black people that look like us. So at the end of the day, um, I think there's two worlds in which we look look at this from. We we usually work for white owners or or. And and so a, a lot of times, you know, you have this, uh, you know, this tear between should I say this, should I not? And then what's the sacrifice, right? On one end. And then what's the sacrifice related to my own community? All right. And so and so that has led us into uh, an elevated period of of activism, right? Uh, the, the death of George Floyd um, served to to reinforce and 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 reintroduce and and, and reveal uh, the racial issues and police brutality, um, and it and it gave us a a greater look at what Colin Kaepernick was was protesting to begin with, right? Uh, since this civil unrest, the NFL has now come out and exclaimed Black Lives Matter. They've even acknowledged the fact that they were wrong in disregarding uh, Colin Kaepernick's original stance. Uh, Nick, I bring this question your way. Is that pivot enough to atone for four years of denial or at best uh, dismissive inaction? Um, <clears throat> absolutely not. And I say that because um, there's usually, there's been a tendency, um, especially with entities. And we looked at, you know, from a historical perspective, um, you know, when we march or when we, um, advocate or, um, you know, we, we, we scream and yell that we're tired. Uh, we have, we've been pacified, um, traditionally. And so for the NFL to, to come out and say it, obviously that's one thing. Okay. You acknowledged it, but it's, it's one thing to, um, endorse, um, something in terms of change, but it's another to actually invest in it. And you see that a lot. Um, you know, I, you saw a lot of kind of reactor, reactive pandering um, from a lot of different entities, not only NFL, but, you know, from everyone wanting to make a PC statement. I'd even go to an, ex- I'd even go to an extent of the University of Texas as well, too. But, with, you know, um, in terms of making sure that they're saying the right things because, you know, silence is essentially compliance. And so it's like, well, everyone's saying it everyone's acknowledging it. Let's go ahead and maybe be the first um, to just put it out there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's much more, I think they, I think because of, because of the, I would say that because of the, probably because of the pandemic and I would say the, maybe the lack of sports as being maybe a distraction Mm -hmm. um, or other things that would normally take up individuals attention being able to see, you know, eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd's death, um, being able to, for, you know, for it being at the forefront, I think what it did is it, it finally sunk in. Clearly there's been more deaths in the past, you know, right. us as black people, we can say, well, this has been going on. And sometimes my, even my first thought was like, okay, why now? You know, why do you care now? Um, but I think that um, opened up a lot, a, a lot of people's eyes. And you know, with with the NFL specifically, I think they 
they understood that they understood that it was the right thing to say but i also think that um, in terms of actually endorsing change and basically putting your putting their money where their mouth is that's yet to be seen because you know it's easy to kind of jump on the train and 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 hop on what's popular but only time will tell but i don't think that that's just uh just enough right and so i i agree um covid19 gave gave uh the the movement a, a big assist right uh people were forced to sit and focus uh they didn't have the distractions or an escapism to to pull them away from it and so what we saw from that was you know it's like putting fire to a powder keg Right. And it, and, it, and it took off across the nation and, and across the world. Um, and so now that we've we've kind of moved down the road uh, a couple of months and people are clamoring for normalcy and every sport organization that you can think of is starting to try to restart their seasons or finish their seasons. Um, how do we feel about the return of sport? Are we do we believe that, you know, what we know to have helped the cause can also be a hindrance? I mean, if you're a sports enthusiast, you're going to be able to turn on the television in, in a couple of weeks and have your pick of any sport you ever thought you wanted to watch uh, as they all jam into this uh, three or four month period. So, Shalanda, I ask you, do you do you believe the return of sport is a hindrance to to the focus that was applied before on the movement? I don't believe that the return of sport will necessarily um, diminish all of the focus or attention um, that we've raised for social injustice, especially since we previously talked about that now we see those intertwined. We see athletes now across the board utilizing their platforms to speak out. And so that's one thing. And also there's a world, there's a world outside of athletics and the world is not going to rest until these issues are addressed. And so there's still going to be people protesting. There's still going to be leaders of authority and of influence speaking out. And so I don't think that by returning sports, it's going to get America off the hook because um, there's still going to be a lot of influential leaders who won't rest until the issue is addressed. And also athletes are now utilizing their platforms um, to speak out. And, and, you know, the natural reaction from, from something like this is that uh, we tend to want to shield ourselves. Uh, we tend to want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, create, own for ourselves. Uh, and so a lot of what I'm starting to hear, and maybe I've heard it before, but more, more so prevalently and definitely behind uh, some of these, these um, social media, we're pushing our, our top uh, athletes, or we're hoping to push our top athletes to the HBCUs. Um, Shalanda, I'll come right back to you on that. What is your, what is your idea um, about that call to action? I think that it's great if an athlete desires to go to an HBCU. I personally can't tell an athlete to do that, a Premier Elite athlete to do that, because I personally was the number one recruit out of coming out of high school, and I could go anywhere um, on a full scholarship but I chose University of Texas at Austin. So I personally can't ask um, a, an athlete in the same position to do that. But I think if they have that desire and they want to do that, that is amazing. And um, I encourage them to do that because also that can help that university as well. Um, but I think that is great. But I personally can't, can't ask that because I didn't do that myself. Okay. Vanessa, what, what are your thoughts on, on the HBCU uh, initiative? No, I, I, I totally agree with Shalanda. I think I'm conflicted, right? Because I didn't make that choice. But what I do respect is that uh, these athletes are thinking about it. And again, about their social consciousness and awareness is out of this world. And, and so that I get a lot of respect for. And if you think about just the business side of sport, which we could talk a whole panel around that and the fact of in some instances, some of these high profile athletes may only be at a school for a year, but the revenue that they will drive for those schools in that one year is commendable, right? And, and, and so I, for that, I applaud their effort to understand that and be really aware of their power and how they're taking that to put it back into their community or back into the black community and being really intentional with it. But I agree, I love my university. So I didn't make that personal choice, but I, I respect them for thinking about it and doing so. Absolutely. Well, I, um, I, I'm conflicted as well, right? I understand why 
but if I if I had to take my hat off, my academic hat off, I had to take my my cultural hat off, and I put myself in the position of the athlete, and 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 I mean solely as an athlete, right? And let's be honest, I mean a lot of times these kids are making decisions as athletes and not as student athletes, right? And if I had to advise a kid on what would be better for his or her development, I gotta be honest with you. I think I'd, I think I'd still steer him to the PWI because of what those institutions have in place to help mold and to develop those athletes. I don't think that, uh, sure, you can go to an HBCU, you can go to D2, you can go to NAIA, and your professional opportunities are still there if you possess the talent to get there, right? Um, each of these organizations have scouts that go out and their job is to find the talent. But I think for a four to five year span where you are trying to uh, maximize that, that opportunity as an athlete, I would direct myself as, as, a, as an 18 year old kid in 2020, or if I had a mentor or, or a son or nephew or daughter that was making that decision and, and they had HBCU versus uh, PWI as an athlete only, I think I would uh, still take them to the, the PWI route, uh, as Vanessa says. The, the business side of it is not as simple as get a kid there and so does the money go. Um, there's a lot to get done in order to make that HBCU ready to receive the kind of talent um, that, that could descend upon it. They have, they have some catching up to do. What are your thoughts on that, Nick? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a, it, it's a, personally for me, it's a tug of war. Um, and I think I, I share, I share the same sentiments as, as the rest of the panelists, um, uh, Shalanda and, and Vanessa specifically, uh, and yourself, just in terms of, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I can't steer uh, the, the, the black athlete to, um, you know, to an HBCU because I didn't go. Um, in retrospect, you know, I can I can look back and say, you know, if I knew some of the things that I knew now, um, that I may have uh, considered um, going that route, just based on uh, me being more aware and more open to how things work systematically. Um, and on a business, on a business standpoint, but then also too, on a personal standpoint, you know, being able to, um, be in an environment where I'm not, to I'm not tolerated, you know, I'm not just, to I'm not just tolerated, but I'm actually celebrated. Um, and you can, you know, there's a, there's a lot of blurry lines, um, when it comes to a predominantly white institute, um, in terms of, you know, be, you, you kind of get tossed between being celebrated and tolerated. Um, and you see that a lot. Uh, at, whereas in a, I feel like, I would feel like in a, at HBCU, you are um, more in touch and more in contact with, with your culture and seeing it and, and mingling with people that are, that look like you and that are around you and that you would feel that have the best, your best interest at heart. I think there is a, when you go to a PWI, <clears throat> as much fun as it may be and as much as uh, they may offer sometimes in the back of your head, you know, there are some invisible chains um, or that you may not see, you know, that don't necessarily um, celebrate your culture or your individuality. Um, at least that's what my experience was. And I'm pretty sure we could probably all connect the dots on that. Um, so, I say all that to say this is that I think today's athlete, especially understanding the climate and kind of a, a, a going forward is that they'll probably at least consider it. I think there was already one major basketball player that decided to go. Um, and so that could set off a chain event. Right. Um, right. And, and I think he expressed personally why he wanted to go. And he saw some. He saw he saw a picture. He saw a bigger picture, um, in terms of in terms of maybe uh, eventually leveling the playing field. Um, so, and he may have seen some things, especially on the internet or you know Twitter, and probably saw how, how there might have been some people that were cheering him on, that were celebrating him, right, and, and kind of celebrating slash tolerating him. And then you know once he spoke up, 
he really saw people's true intentions. And you see, I've seen it a lot. It's absolutely disgusting. Um, but that's 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 what we're dealing with. And I think, like I said, going forward, there probably would be a uh, probably more consideration. I think more careful consideration by the athletes going forward. If I if I had to put a uh, if I had to place a bet on it. <laughs> well, I think I think we would probably all agree on the fact that uh, they definitely have the support or more support uh, going through and treachering through, you know, these times, um, you know, at our own PWI, <laughs> our, our black athletes and, and uh, some non-black athletes have, have found their voice and they've, they've stepped up and they've made some demands and, and requests. And uh, we've been, you know, pacified in my opinion uh, to a certain extent uh, with some of the things that will take place. Um, but what I saw from social media, Nick, is is exactly what what you were discussing, right? Um, you're you're the greatest thing since sliced bread until you speak, right? And when you speak, that's when they show you what they think about you, right? And how much value you have outside of uh, winning a national championship, sinking a three, or you know blocking for a, a national record, big O. Um, what do you what do you think we can do to help continue to support these kids to so that they have the fortitude to continue to put their necks out there? Because I I called uh, immediately once that that letter went out. Um, anyone who would who would who would have my who would let me have their ear, right? Because I was concerned about um, what about the kid, right? I knew exactly what would take place. Once they once they stepped off the uh, the range by themselves, mm-hmm. right? And so, how how can we uh, continue to encourage them to have the fortitude to to put their necks out there? Um, you know, we know what was promised as as change. What are the next steps, right? Because it can't be just what we what we received. And so, we want to continue to push. And and how do we offer our support, Octavius? Yeah, I I mean I commend you on that because the 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 truth of the matter is is um, no one hires you. you don't, the only reason we got, you get hired is that people can go to work with you every day. Right. Really, Absolutely. there's a need, but the truth of the matter is, oh, I can work with him. <laughs> you know, right. uh, we, we, we have good jobs, but we have good jobs because we fall into possibly that 10% that we right. all know what that 10% means, right? <laughs> and right. Um, that's, that's just the truth. Um, I believe that uh, intimacy causes temporary instability, which means I believe we all have a responsibility to do what Ivan did, to put our necks out for them. I'm a 45-year-old man. I have my career. I have my career set. Some people like you. By this time, you figured out you don't care who don't like you. So right now, it's time for us. If these kids are going to step out, they have to recognize what the sacrifice is, right? And that that there is a sacrifice and that this very well may come back up when they sit in an interview. And they very well may be asked about this. So I'm right with you, Ivan. This is what I have to also say to to, to also be very transparent about myself. I didn't have the knowledge base to do what they did. I'm I'm serious. I just didn't, guys. I was, I mean, I, I... uh, you know, my, my academics weren't very good until I finally realized after everything was over that, oh, I actually can do some stuff. It took me a while to get to that place. But I, but I, come, from a, I come from a survival environment. I grew up in a, in a survival environment. So just the fact that I was going to be able to play, to, to play a sport where I could assault somebody without getting in trouble was my, was my, was my number one goal. These kids are much more informed, like we talked about in the, in, the, in the beginning. And they, it's our job to have them, to give them some insight on what they may be facing, because just like Nick said, there are some invisible spots, invisible planes that many of us are still traveling through, by the way. We, 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 we're not giving, we're at one meeting, but there's a meeting after that meeting. Right. 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 Meeting before and after the meeting. Before and after that meeting. And sometimes one of them may be about us. Right. Uh, And and so we have to be honest about this. So I I, I commend you, man, for 
for doing it and being honest. What their intention is good, but at the end of the day, I mean, as a man with kids and married, you know, I got crazy responsibilities and people to manage. I gotta. We have to let them know, hey, you can do this, and I think it's okay. But understand now what sacrifice really means. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I, and another thing too that, and especially when you think about athletes and, and speaking out, um, you know, it, it you have some that will. Um, be a little bit more, they'll lead a little bit more from the feet. And then you have some that maybe lead from the seat. Um, and you'll have, you have, you have some that think about that. The first thing they'll think about is, wow, you know what? I, I want to say something, but I feel muted because will this come back up? Will this come back up? You know, will I be um, subjected to um, someone feeling a way in, maybe blackballing me from opportunities. And I think one thing that we have to understand too, um, and this wasn't, this wasn't really brought up to me a whole lot growing up, or at least we just didn't see it as, 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 uh, as black people is that, you know, you look at two lanes right here. You think about, you know, if we're not running, jumping or uh, dribbling the basketball or, you know, tackling people, then, we're kind of null and void. No one listens to us. Um, and that does something to you psychologically to think that, hey, these are the, you know, for the majority, these are the, these are the, a couple of lanes that I got, you know, and if, <laughs> and if these lanes don't work out or if the, or if there's some type of obstruction to these lanes, then I'm totally confused. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, um, or at least I don't feel the confidence to be able to navigate uh, through a through a world or through different pitfalls that that are that will come with that and so the first thing that someone who maybe doesn't have all of the tools or just the awareness or the knowledge of saying hey you know what I am I'm strong this I, you know I'm I'm capable of being an entrepreneur you know doing things for self um, and and not necessarily worried about a lot of those things or not solely dependent on someone writing a check for me, um, then I probably, you know, feel more compelled to speak up. So it's a lot of, we could, we could go, we could go, I could definitely go in a, uh, go, go in a wormhole and talk about a lot of those things. <laughs> there's a lot of different, there's a lot, a lot of different levels to it. We probably would have, I have a few volumes of this. <laughs> well, every, 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 uh, series thus far, um, we've only been able to scratch the surface, right? Yeah. Um, each each topic we've hinted on goes much deeper than than the uh, allotted amount of time will allow for us to dig into, and so uh, we're doing our best to keep it concise and touch on touch on those things that um, we think make sense to everyone out there watching. Um, but you know, I do want to say one thing, Ivan. Okay, I'm sorry, Vanessa. Go ahead. No, 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 no. because it, it actually goes back to you. Because I think what Nick and Big O said is 100% um, accurate. I think the piece that you did was the allyship that they need, right, in the support. And I think it has inspired me to say, what's your role in that even as a former athlete, right? And so I think that that mm -hmm. is also to your point in terms of like, what can we do and how do we show them the support is, I know there's been a lot of language in this social unrest around acknowledgement first, then there's that piece around the actions and then the accountability piece. And I think we all within our levels and within our reason can make sure that we're holding people accountable and for those actions that we all want to see. So one, I commend you for doing it. Well, well you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I reacted emotionally, right? Like I said, I knew what was coming. So I didn't have any answers when I, when I called to ask people how I could help or what, what could I do? I, I couldn't, I mean, it was, it was asked to me by one of the coaches, well, what do you think you can do? I don't know, but I'm here, right? And, and, and I can be um, a sounding board for some of these kids uh, who need to have some tough conversations, but look around and do not see yes. anyone that they're comfortable with to have those kind of conversations, yes. right? Your, your coach is going to be your coach. Um, and so there's always going to be some limitations um, as to what you may or may not share with him or her. Uh, and so I thought maybe, maybe that was it, right? As they uh, try to dig through and process all of these things on their own, if they didn't have someone, maybe I could serve that purpose. 
Um, but and 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 all of that, um, Vanessa. If I'm not sure if you followed all the 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 webinars that that have happened. Last last one that that took place was inequality, uh, and the moderator, I believe her name was Amanda, um, floated the the idea of black privilege. Mm -hmm. Right. Some agreed, some did not. Um, but as an athlete, and if I'm being real with myself, I've, I've experienced athletic privilege. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I wonder if that privilege that, that you, that you receive once you've kind of been identified as someone who's decent at what they do, uh, if that creates an unintended bubble, uh, to where as an athlete, you're sometimes oblivious to, to what's going on in the world as far as racial issues. I mean, you're aware, again, we've talked about the platforms and how information is right at their fingertips, but they're not all experiencing it the same, right? Um, simply because the athlete to walk into um, what we'll call a hostile environment. How have you um, experienced it or, or maybe you haven't? Gotcha. I think you froze. Did you say Vanessa? You started with me? Go with it. Okay, my bad. If you didn't, <laughs> no, yo, someone else. I was like, can you say my name? It's frozen right now. I, I, I threw it out to the panel. So if, you, if, you, if you're froggy. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you, I think it's real, right? And, and it, I'll start with a joke first because Evelyn, one of the people who has become a good friend of mine in our adulthood, I did not know her at UT. And partially the reason why is because I played basketball. And I, I mean, as all of us, we play sports, but I was so focused on sport. And then whoever my friends were, and those used to be, those were athletes, was probably first the female athletes and then the male athletes. And that was my bubble. And so I can imagine besides just like the UT black culture life that I might have missed out. Like I knew about soul nights and some other things, but just everyday experiences, we did not have those as other, just, at, I mean, just other students in general, let's just go there. And then definitely not black students. And so I do think there's a little bit of like that awareness that we did not know that was happening. If there was any unrest or there are things or discrimination because that exists if you're black anywhere in America, but there is a little bit of it as you're an athlete, especially at a school like Un University of Texas. It has such um, financial means that you're put that that what you um, bring to the table from your athleticism, you get back in the experience that you have as an athlete. And so I can imagine that there's a lot of privilege that we do walk around with and that we weren't even aware of, if you will. You missed out. <laughs> but now you I know out. you. The best you, missed out. <laughs> you missed out. I'll back away. Solanda, Solanda coming from your... Your, your pedigree, I think I heard you say, or I remember you saying that you were the number one uh, athlete, uh, track and field athlete in your, in your class. Um, I'd have to imagine that come with some privilege. <laughs> well, I will say that um, a little bit twofold, though. Um, I, in high school, though, yes, I was number one recruit coming out of, in the nation, but I was also graduate number seven in my class. So I was in AP classes, advanced classes, most of the time, the only person that looked like me. So I had two folds. And then I was in Macomb Business School, again, one of two that looked like me, and sometimes the only athlete in the business school, because we all know that the business school is one of the best in the, in the country. All of our majors are the top 10, so it's very competitive. So I had a dose of both sides. Um, so I was, just because I had on a uniform, did it make me, I want to get back to the question, oblivious to the socials and justices. Yes, I am an athlete, but I was always aware and knew that I was a black student athlete. And just because I put on a uniform, it did not change the color of my skin or remove the social injustices outside of the athletic world, because there is a world outside of athletics. And when I, um, left study hall or left the track and had to go into that McCombs Business School um, and be one of two maybe that looked like me, I was very quickly aware of who I was. Um, and so I, I don't think that um, being a, a black student athlete makes you oblivious to the social injustices or unaware. Um, 
I believe that just because you have a uniform on doesn't mean that you're not aware of what's going on around you. But me personally, my experience was a little bit different because like I said, I was still in classrooms, one of two people that looked like me. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, know, I know Big O spoke to, to a bubble, uh, being laser focused on, on football and NFL. Uh, sometimes we create our own bubbles, right? But I think it's unintended that we, we get sucked into it. Uh, I would say that most athletes that I knew that were on campus, I mean, it was a concentrated effort to break out of the athletic bubble, to, to branch out and, and befriend those who weren't at the training table eating with you every day, that weren't in the training room with you every day, the weight room with you every day, and that you know, three hour practice that you were gonna have every day. Uh, it was a it was a very conscious effort to do that. Some were mm-hmm. some were good at it. Some fell into their bubble and, and they were never able to to come out of it. Um, but you know the the thing about about being an athlete at the University of Texas is I mean you are you are a little bit privileged, right? Your your locker rooms are better. Your your training tables are better. Um, your training rooms better. Your weight rooms better. Your your facilities are better. That in and of itself. Especially nowadays, the, the facilities that y'all have. <laughs> Listen. Listen. <laughs> only, only, only getting better. I'm, I'm looking at this uh, South End project on the football stadium, and it's only getting better. Uh, so, and the new basketball arena that they're going to be throwing up. Um, I think they're doing some renovations currently over at Track and Field, at least in the locker rooms. Uh, so, so it's only getting better. So there's a there's a little bit of a a privilege that is uh, exercised by attending the University of Texas as opposed to maybe some other universities. Um, one, one question that, that, that often comes up <clears throat> is the, you know, the idea of is the collegiate athlete uh, exploited, All right? Um, a friend of mine often tosses around the phrase, fair exchange ain't no robbery, All right? Uh, and so the exchange that takes place uh, as a student athlete or an athlete student, as I, I like to say from time to time, is that you give your blood, sweat, and tears in exchange for financial aid. Um, do we consider that to be a fair exchange, or uh, is that considered to be exploitive to the the athlete? Nick, what do you what do you think on that? Uh, absolutely not. It's, it's, it's not a fair exchange. Um, you know, and a lot of, a lot of times what we, you know, what we think of in terms of like, Hey, I got a full ride. I got a, you know, I got a scholarship, you know, everything is, you think about the word free. Um, and nothing's free about, you know, putting in work, um, uh, essentially the same amount of work as a professional and, um, and not getting uh, compensated or stipend for it. Right. So um, the university uh, is essentially an entity that is garnering or, you know, uh, basically profiting um, all of this, all this revenue that's coming in based off of the product, um, which is the athlete, right? right. And we are expendable. Um, you know, I've, I have three surgeries myself to, to show for it, right? Uh, big O, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure all of us, you know, have been through injuries, or, or you know, I guess you know that, that we probably still kind of deal with today. Um, but we aren't able to capitalize off that. We're basically it's basically a yearly contract um, with a contractor, which happens to be us, who does not get paid um, for their services. Um, just to you know, we just say, hey, you know, in exchange for your talents. We'll give you, you know, room, board, oh, yeah, room and board, some books, and um, we'll sell you a dream on, you know, the, the possibility of becoming a professional. Which, mm-hmm. in, in at the at at a high level, <clears throat> we understand that that percentage is very low um, in terms of the the transition. And then, of course, the promise of not only that, but then, of course, hey, a degree, you know, that will somehow change your life. Uh, but at the end of the day. When you finish, you understand that you're still black and in America afterwards. That's not to it's not to say that we can't progress, right? But it's it's exactly. it's so many different um, areas that we're exploited that we can't uh, garner any type of equity in terms of 
uh, that that level of sustainability. So that's the promise. We may make it to professional to where all of those years pay off and that we could potentially become big earners. But uh, in the in the meantime, you know, it's uh, it's something that we're being exploited up, exploited on uh, without um, reaping any type of uh, benefit in terms of sustainability and equity. Right. And so, I mean, obviously, you know, a stipend or some form of financial compensation uh, would be the uh, the easiest way to see um, some equity in, in, in what we are, are putting back into the university. But I ask the question also, you know, how well are we being prepared uh, for our post-collegiate careers, right? Is that also a way to create some equity there? Uh, are our counterparts getting opportunities um, afforded to them that that have not been afforded to us or or to your point Nick, are we all just kind of um, banging our bodies around and 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 walking out of there with a degree but with no real path to to create a difference um, once we've once we've graduated what are your thoughts on that Shalanda? I would say that it's it's um well again it's up to the institution making sure that they have things in place for example career readiness and a, a great career department um, for their student athletes, which we have that at UT and it's grown since um, I've been there. I know Tina Kine, who was my counselor there, um, is in charge of the, the career department there. But it's up to the athlete to have that consciousness, which I would say student athletes now do, of thinking ahead of what does my life look like after sports? Um, even as a professional athlete, already thinking ahead of what does life look like when I decide to um, retire and thinking ahead and setting yourself up for success. Um, now their student athletes are actually taking internships or figuring out something around their schedule outside of their sport or something to get those experiences where there's a capstone class or something like that. Um, making sure that you're doing mock interviews or preparing yourself, um, how to build a resume, all of those things that sometimes athletes don't think of until after they are um, out of school. So number one, making sure, holding the, the athletic departments accountable, making sure that they have some type of career readiness thing available for athletes to utilize. And then also they're making sure that student athletes, because it's part of our responsibility too as a student athlete, to think about that, we have the Student Athlete Advisory Council, which are some of the students who made those demands that we talked about earlier. I actually, since we're talking about our others more privileged than us, I was actually nominated by the Big 12 Conference to be the student athlete um, advisory committee representative for the whole Big 12 Conference. So I, I a black woman, represented all student athletes for the Big 12 Conference um, on the National D1 SAC committee. And then for those committees, I was actually nominated to be the national representative for the Olympic Sports Liaison Committee. So the opportunities are out there. It's just making sure that you are utilizing that. I was also involved in other student organizations, making sure that I was ready once I graduated. So I think it's more of an awareness and making sure um, that the students know what's available to them and have that mindset. Because I had the, I had the experience to represent all of our um, Big 12 student athletes and then all of the national athletes on the D1 SAC committee. So I. I didn't fall in that there were others were more privileged than me. I took those opportunities and was actually nominated um, to do it. So uh, it's just being aware and um, utilizing those opportunities and thinking ahead, in which I would say this generation of athletes are doing that. Right. I think, I think um, also um, sometimes it's, it's driven by, by sport. Uh, right. And I, and, I, and I say that because, you know, I, I heard you mention internship. Uh, and I know that a lot of times, um, let's say football, for instance, they spend their entire summers on campus, uh, conditioning, lifting weights, yep. getting ready for a, a fall season. And so I know, uh, specifically there are individuals who have had to forego opportunities, um, right. for internships because their first priority was to their specialized scholarship, right? right. Uh, on the right. same, along those same lines, uh, I can tell you that, uh, I have a family member who, who recently was told that he could not major in a specific uh, major because it conflicted with their practice. their practice schedule, yep. right? And so there, there's a there's there's maximizing your opportunity, and then there's absent of opportunity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I think uh, sometimes the sport may dictate um, 
what's available to to the athletes and it and it, it would seem that you know some of the higher earning sports are are you know more largely impacted uh in that regard um but but I, I pose another question in the way of exploitation because this i just always ask this question is, does that exploitation still um extend beyond the playing uh field or the the careers of the athlete at the university right i i always talk about what the university or more specifically the athletic department um, does or does not do for athletes beyond the four or five year window, right? Mm -hmm. How after you've completed the exchange, you've given your blood, sweat and tears, they've given you financial aid, no more eligibility, no more, um, your, your degree is uh, secured. Uh, and then the relationships becomes one sided, right? Because you're even at that point then the relationship, relationship becomes one-sided. And maybe this is a UT thing, so I won't speak for all universities, but uh, I know the hand continues to go out in your direction, uh, whether that be, you know, the ask for a financial commitment <clears throat> or um, maybe we're just expected to be walking ambassadors for, for the university, but we aren't necessarily in a position to throw our hand back the other way and receive uh, anything from the university. So we continue to give without receipt. What are your thoughts on that, Vanessa? Yeah, no, that's a deep one. I, I think it, I mean, <laughs> it goes hand in hand, honestly, with the first question. first question. What I was thinking through, as Shalana was talking through, is like, there's personal responsibility. And then I think just like anything, there is systemic changes that have to happen, right? And so ground one is, making sure that the university because this is also personal responsibility i'm going to a school where i know that i will be treated as a student and then an athlete and what are the resources that are going to be available to me i also think that um there's something to um what we were talking about being paid um because it is true like we could not have certain jobs during certain times because athletics was our hobby it was what we were there to do in addition to other things and learn um, and so you did forego, even if it was small jobs. So like, what does it look like to have my scholarship in escrow, right? And so then when we're talking about um, narrowing that uh, wealth gap, then once I graduate, if whether I go pro or not, because we all hear these stories and know these stories all too well of individuals who have gone to professional and haven't made money or have become broke after a while because systemically black families don't understand financial wealth. And I think that was one of the uh, seminars that you guys had, right? So, and I guess I'm just saying, Ivan is like, I think we have to look at it just like racism, right? It's not just one part, there's social, there's economic development, there's all these things. And at university, if they're really truly trying to think about our student athletes and specifically our black student athletes, Mm -hmm. I think they'll have to figure out what is the support system that's needed in all of those areas in order for them to benefit and rock. Because there are white white counterparts might have already come from a two parent home, or they might even have a house to come from, right? So if you don't come from those means, then you're already thinking about, um, as as O even said, like your survival is different. So I think we should think about or dismantle how we're supporting our athletes. And I can't speak to everything at UT currently, right? But I think that that's what I would think about if I'm a student athlete or if I'm a parent of a student athlete, that holistic support system that will make my child, you know, successful currently and then afterwards as well, because that's a part of it for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Big O, I, I know you, you spend some time as an employee of the university. Um, and I think to, to Vanessa's point, to, to all of ours points that, you know, I think we, we need better representation with the folks that are looking out for us uh, while we're on campus, helping us navigate uh, that big machine. And, and what does that look like for us, you know, again, post our collegiate careers. And so with the absence of uh, familiarity, if you will, for lack of better words, uh, someone that, that uh, we can relate to in positions of, of uh, leadership, um, how do we get some of this guidance? You know, are we, are we you know, is there anyone on that campus or, or in, in those positions that has the black student athlete experience in, their, in, our, in our best interest? Are they looking out for us? We're looking out for ourselves, as Shalanda said, but I mean, we can all use a, a little hand and, and not everyone, um, to be frank, has the same drive and initiative as a, a Ms. Goodman. 
Or <laughs> 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 Kathy. Or uh, Kathy on the men's track and field team when we were in school. Where's Kathy? Right. Kathy's, Kathy's no longer there, and I don't. I haven't been around in a while, so I don't know if there's any more Kathys. Uh, maybe there are. I, I'm not sure. It's <laughs> weird to me, and I wasn't even an athlete, so I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, go. What? What do you? I mean, what? In what ways do you think that we could, you know, create that type of change, that systemic change, where where there is a voice in leadership, that there's more voices in leadership that help to guide uh, our young black athletes. Uh, when they enter into these uh, institutions? Yeah, so, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. So glad you asked that question. Uh, it's really dicey, uh, but I'm okay with that. Um, so I was recruited to play football there, but I was also told a story about what the University of Texas could do for me. And once my career was over, I was actually recruited to go back to the university and work. Now, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, once once I got back in that in that position, um, it was a learning experience. Uh, there's the, there's this uh, elation about being back at the place that you love. I absolutely love the University of Texas. I gave everything I had uh, in, in the time I was there, um, you know, to to the University of Texas. But the truth of the matter is, um, the people who look like the like the athletes look like us a lot of the black athletes there are a lot of coaches that look like us but mm -hmm. there are limited positions uh that that look that, that that they can relate to to see themselves past the sport they play mm -hmm. okay um it is uh that's just the truth about it and so what what can we do about that well i was recruited to play for them the truth of the matter is they probably the university of texas and a lot of schools could probably start continuing that recruiting process for those for, for athletes who uh, have 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 gone on like Nick, like uh, Nick Redwine like like people on this panel to come back who understand the culture uh, who who have kind of been through the fire and also know what it means to win championships there <laughs> even who, to, to look like them there is a benefit for recruiting people of color uh, particularly black men. Uh, I just read an article and it, it, I was sitting here thinking about, there was an article about um, what happens to um, black men once they move up educationally mm -hmm. with, so, so whites, whites and black women usually make more money and do well and continue to move up. Once you move into a realm where you have, uh, you know, a few degrees or a PhD or you move up, move up higher. Black men are usually seen as threatening. They're seen as elitist. They're seen as, as know-it-alls, <laughs> and 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 they and they also are seen as a threat. And so we look. They like the threat they saw on film to recruit me to come play. <laughs> right? But but make no mistake, I, that same alpha male is the same alpha male that sits here before you. Right, and that's right. not, and, and and I believe our universities have to become to see that as value. Okay, uh, our athletes are wanting to be uh, 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 wanting to be validated when really and truly they need to be valued. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Validation is different than being valued, and when you value me, you value all of me. Yep. Which means you have a plan right. for me as a ball player, and then there's a plan for me as a man or a woman as I continue to grow. Um, and so, and just to be to, to, to be honest, the the big bad recruit we love, the highly educated you have to pay you you, you that there's there's a position. Uh, of authority, placing into a position of authority that the other black athletes need to see, we got some work to do in that area. We have some work to do in that area. We have a trust, we have a trust issue as it relates to uh, athletes as they begin to move up the ladder, right? Uh, and and, and uh, particularly, to be honest with you, black men. Yeah, uh, great point because I mean, as I walk through the, through the offices of that university athletic department, I don't, I don't see really many of us but I, to be honest, I don't see very many ex 
uh, student athletes as well, which is which is which is fairly fairly odd um, for a university. Um, but uh, I see Evelyn and Shaniqua have have joined us, so I'm I'm thinking we're either approaching the time or we've overrun the time. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry take it away um, we have a couple of different questions uh, I'll let Ev ask the first one but just as a reminder if you do have any questions on Facebook go ahead and post them on Facebook um, I'll be pulling those from Facebook and then also you have the Q&A um, button that you see if you're in the webinar at the bottom of your screen go ahead and post them there as well um, and then let's go ahead and get started with the Q&A. Ev, you want to toss the first question? Sure. No, absolutely. Um, you know, there was a, a question or a discussion um, previously about, you know, whether or not you guys would advise Black athletes to go to a PWI or an HBCU. And, you know, I think obviously because we all went to a PWI, that that's kind of the the approach or the recommendation despite some, some of the um, some of the issues or challenges that we had but um, you know I guess at the end of the day do you do do you think that that would kind of be considered a sellout um, you know especially right now with the temperature that's going on we see individuals who um had their kids committed to pwis but now they're going to hbcus just because of the the current climate right um so taking into context what's going on today versus what you went through signing up i mean would you still recommend those individuals go to a pwi versus the hbcu and if you did say a pwi do you consider that as being kind of a, a sellout or taking the, the, the easier path? Uh, the, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I would say the, the easier path to what would be my first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, no, I don't, I don't at all see it as, uh, as a sellout. As the answer that I gave when we were discussing it is that um, as an athlete, again, taking out any uh, cultural um, benefits, taking out any educational benefits, as an athlete, the University of Texas, and I'll use that because it's near and dear to all of our hearts, um, offers far more in the way of developing an athlete um, from equipment, from uh, registered dietitians and their nutritional programs. Um, and so if I'm, if I'm making a decision as an athlete, uh, the HBCU is far behind where the PWIs are and, and how they can develop an athlete. Uh, it's, Part of the reason there are uh, only a few number of them that exceed to the next level. But uh, again, it's not that it's impossible. I guess it's the harder road. That makes sense. Anyone else want to touch it? I just wanted to clarify um, that it's not necessarily the recommendation um, to go to a PWI, it's my, my response is more so if you personally have the desire and passion and want to go to HBCU, that is awesome. And I commend you wanting to do that. And I don't want to um, portray the idea that if someone chooses not to and wants to go to a PWI like I did, that doesn't make you a sellout. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're choosing an easier route. In some cases, it may be even harder because you don't have as many people around you that look like you. And so there's other um, challenges that you have to overcome by putting yourself in that environment. So it's not necessarily you're taking the easier route. And also you can still, you, you can still make a difference and an impact no matter where you are. Um, I, and so many other athletes utilize opportunities that are available to them to speak out and to have leadership positions and take leadership roles and do things that were passionate about them or passionate for them. So just because you go to a PWI doesn't mean that you can't still make a difference um, and utilize that space um, for the cause and things that you're passionate about. So no, it's all about how you utilize your opportunities in the space that you're in. So if you choose to get there and not do anything and utilize your platform and your voice or um, stand for something that you believe in, then that's a different case. Um, but if you utilize the opportunity to make a difference, then no, absolutely not. You're not a sellout. Okay. 
Um, a, a quick follow up to that, based on a comment that Nick had, um, g Nick gave earlier. What are the things that you know now? Because you mentioned if if I if I knew these things now, you know, back then. So what are some of those things that you know now that you were not privy to when you were a younger um, a younger student athlete? What are those things? What would have influenced you? What has occurred? Um, quite simply, my history. Um, because obviously strategically that had, that, you know, we can go back as far as, <laughs> you know, 400 years ago and understand that that was, um, that was by design to distance us from that. Okay. And I'd even go to say that, you know, there are, um, strategies and, and policies in place to continue that. But I think it, I think primarily just my history and, and knowing um, some of the things I had to really unlearn and relearn. Um, we can all agree that there's probably things that we learned over our, over our time, especially when it comes in the realm of education, right? Uh, of, of a story that was told a certain way to fit a certain um, strategy, strategy in, in, a, in a certain, um, uh, a certain agenda. And so, a lot of what I learned or a lot of what I amassed was post formal education, you know, formal education will earn you a, a, a living, you know, but uh, self-education will earn you a fortune. And so I think just being, just, just being um, more aware in that regard uh, led me to, to, to kind of think about some of those things. So. Okay. I'd like to answer that. Can I talk? Can I, can I speak on that? Please, please. I, and I, I truly, I truly hope this helps someone. Um, I, I spent my, my, I spent my career uh, really trying to help those with mental health, right? And but I've, what I've done more uh, after that help is given is to really invest in their mental wealth. Mm. And for me, my. Now that I'm a more mental well, I have more mental wealth than I did early on. I see. Um, I don't have regrets. I, I had a great career. We won three championships. I blocked for a Heisman Trophy winner. It was it was great. I met some wonderful people. Still have some lifelong relationships. But this is something that really really bothers me. I uh, I don't have a strong relationship uh, of other black people outside of the locker room. Mm -hmm. And I, I can be honest with you, and I'm gonna be honest with you, that I'm really bothered by that. Um, I'm really bothered by that because I love the texture of my hair. I love the tone of my skin. I love the, the way that I talk and I love the way that I walk. And at the end of the day, um, I allowed athletics to rob me from understanding that there was a whole nother world and a whole nother a, a part of my culture that I that I probably fit more into. Yep. Um, uh, I didn't. I didn't read. I didn't. I, I've always wanted to join a fraternity. I didn't read. I didn't reach out and try to form those relationships. Mm. I see some of the guys now at the games or whatever. They were always cool with me. I probably could have joined a fraternity. I'm not. They didn't. They never turned me away. They never said that. No one ever said that. You, oh, you're a ball player. You can't be a part of this. I just didn't. I'm just, I just didn't, and I have to be. I have to be honest about that, right? I can't. I can't, um, you know, try to fluff and you know and act like that. I, I, I tried and I did. I just didn't. And I, um, uh, like I said, I don't have regrets. I'm just. I'm just being honest. And I, hopefully, this helps someone who uh, is at UT right now, uh, and and so that they take advantage of the the times and and what we're in. That they will open their eyes and become more aware uh, mm -hmm. that they're that they're uh, they gain more discernment. <laughs> right about uh, about this okay yep. so um you know i don't know if i even answer the question but i'm just <laughs> <laughs> big, old, big old that's the uh that's the intended <laughs> yeah i mean if you spoke. don't mind you know i think i'd like to pull from what you've said octavius um you know twofold with two individuals here on panel so um i'll probably go to vanessa first um I didn't know Vanessa in school, did not know. I mean, I knew 
of Vanessa, you know, basketball player, you know, we knew of the athletes, but I did not know Vanessa. And so it didn't come until, what, Vanessa, you came for our um, uh, the best. Texas, Texas OU event mm -hmm. with Brandy, and it was like, I mean, but it was like years after we had been in school, years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, oh, you cool, I'm cool. Like, Actually, we could have been cool in school. <laughs> right. Because she was locked into her basketball scheme, right? And there really wasn't there really wasn't a whole lot of intermingling of the athletes with the black, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it what it is, black scholarship, education scholarship people. Because at UT that's what it was. I mean, either you were there. You had an athletic scholarship or you had an educational scholarship. And so there wasn't a whole lot of intermingling between us. So like Vanessa, I would have not known her. Well, I didn't know her until years later. <laughs> the other individual is actually Ivan. And I think only because Carlton was the outlier of the men's basketball team. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. And Carlton didn't stick with the basketball team. He was like in, like he was with the rest of us at the Malcolm X Lounge and chilling. <laughs> so that when Ivan came on, then like Ivan was under his his wing, and I think that's the only reason that like we knew Ivan as not just an athlete, but like someone who like ran Jester with us and up and down Jester West, you know? But there, there is a, well, there was at least a, a complete difference or segregation between the scholarship athletes versus the scholarship uh, smart people. Uh, right. Hey, 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 Mm -hmm. it, it's so easy to remain in that bubble, right? And uh, to O's point, hopefully, whomever's listening, if there's some that are currently in school, they they take heed and they 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 put forth the effort to kind of come out of that bubble. There's more to it than just what the athletic department will build around you, because if you allow for it, they will they will build a fort around you uh, and keep you in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to add, which I agree with you, O, I remember. Once basketball was over my senior year, so from that March through the end, and I graduated in four years, but I was like, I would want to go back as a regular student because that those three months were so cool in terms of like not having to have such a regimented schedule and I probably would have met more people. And, and I do think you have to go into it very intentional and trying to make sure that you're building relationships outside of athletics. And hopefully, and I think some of it probably is generational too. We went to school back in the 90s and early 2000s and I would hope that some of the athletes who are in school today don't have those same challenges. Um, but absolutely, I would. I've missed all of these years of knowing Ev, but I I made up for it in the last, I guess, ten years of knowing. Ev. Oh, we we've closed the gap pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> you all are funny. <laughs> uh, you all are funny. Uh, I'm looking for the next question. Um, just a second, I, but I will kind of build on while I'm looking for the next question with Ev. My experience was a little bit different. Um, of course, I knew the basketball team because of Carlton Dixon, but I actually knew a lot of the football team because of where I stayed in the summers. Um, and so I got to know a lot of them as far as the years that I was there. And then some of the other student athletes, because I actually worked in the study hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew the student athletes there and I also knew all y'all social security numbers because that's when we used to play. Oh, yeah, I, I would have remembered all that. And if I would be dishonest, I would be like, oh, only pop it. <laughs> But next question, um, <laughs> do you all see a day where UT athletes will be paid for their services and what would you, what would have to happen for that to be a reality? I, I, th there will be a day. Um, and what I think you, I think what you see now is the NCAA 
giving uh, very small victories to prevent that from happening just just yet. All right. Um, you see the cost of living stipend uh, that wasn't there when we were there. You saw, I think, on the tail end of of, of my uh, UT career, they allowed you to to work, um, but but it was a little bit of a joke because you could only earn up to like twenty five hundred dollars gross over the amount of a, a full scholarship or something like that. But um, by the time I graduated, that was an option. So they continue to give uh, small incremental pieces to push off for as long as they could possibly push it off. The idea that they will have to to face that that reality of pay for play. It's coming. It's coming. Anyone else? It's coming. Yeah, I believe it's it's it's, it's inevitable. Um, as as I do, like there's they're not wanting to start the turnover uh, yet, but uh, eventually, um, especially with uh, you know some I, I think some, some good policy and, and regulation, um, and of course, just the progressive, uh, just kind of the progressive environment that we're at a tug of war with uh, right now. I think eventually that will happen. Okay. Yeah, I I, I see. Uh, Ty commented. Uh, the the uh, Ty, image. Ty's commented uh, a bit. Let's, let's, let's yeah. get Ty in there. Yeah, Ty. Yeah. Yeah, Ty. But that, that's a very good point. Again, you know, allowing the athletes to uh, benefit from their image and likeness, which was never an um, a possibility before. Again, it's it's small gives that they're trying to stave off what eventually will happen. Yeah. Merchandising too goes. That, that falls right in there too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the comments from Facebook, I think, actually feeds into what you guys are discussing right now. Um, Kevin stated that pro sports is a PWI. It's all a business. Um, so with that, <laughs> first of all, do y'all agree <laughs> that? Um, it, well, it's, it's definitely a business. It's, it's a business. business. Um, and and a subset perhaps of pro sports, and then. With that being said, on the other side of that, as being former athletes, how do you feel about that business really making money in billions of dollars, not millions, but billions of dollars off of your blood, sweat, and tears? Because they're, ma they're making money off of your knees, your back, <laughs> your neck. From, um, a, from, from a professional, from a professional uh, standpoint or collegially? Collegiate. Um, well, I, again, I think we, we address it. I think um, everyone except for Shalanda agreed that it was exploitive. <laughs> Wait, everybody said <laughs> so what is the, what is like, the don't tell me. Okay. I, no, I believe oh, athletes no. should get paid. I believe athletes should get paid. Get, I do get the money. Them. Get the money. Yes. Right, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a monopoly, <laughs> right? There's, there, there's, there's really nowhere else for the collegiate athlete to turn right now, right? Yeah, especially when, especially so when you can that find it. is a, a, a means of getting to. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It was a delay. It was, a, it was a delay with you, Ivan. You were oh no, I, I I just said you know it's 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 a it's a form of a monopoly right now. Uh, there's not very many avenues for the uh, aspiring high school athlete to seek out other other ways to get to you know the professional rank. So you you must go through the creative path. Okay. Um, I have yeah, I, 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 I want to. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Please. Uh, I, I want to be kind of a, the, the devil's advocate in this because, you know, our we talked about the HBCUs, right? So what happens there uh, if athletes are paid? Mm, I see where like, we're where, going. Where do we go? I mean, where, what, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm just kind of putting it out there because we did talk about that. Um, well, I'll tell you this really quickly. I was just going to interject because there was a, a panel, uh, a question from one of our participants that just said that I reject the argument that students shouldn't go to an HBCU because it's not real life. Hashtag fake news. So I think that goes right along with the direction of your of your uh, conversation. 
Yeah, and 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 I'm I'm not saying that they that, that they should that they shouldn't go. Um, I, I I believe it's an individual choice. At the end of the day, uh, you're gonna have to make it make that choice because depending on what sport you play and how good you are, uh, you may be at that school for about five years, right? And if you're going if you're gonna be there, uh, what's what's the what's your earning potential? I mean, like I said, I mean my my, my mother my mother worked in the school cafeteria and was worked at McDonald's for the second job. I left I left football practice and went to close at McDonald's with her. I'm coming to the University of Texas. If I if I'm gonna make a little bit more money because I gotta I gotta put I gotta put more money uh, back I gotta send some money home right and and then so um, yeah it's a it's a it's a tough it's a, it's a, it's a tough one I don't have an answer I'm just kind of putting well, it out there I, I think I think the 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 question um, resonates so much more than if we had this conversation six months ago right mm -hmm. it's because just the dynamics of everything have completely changed so these questions are actually coming from people that went to ut right i mean right. so obviously they chose a pwi over an hbcu 10 15 20 years ago but now level setting and 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 looking at what we're dealing with today now with our kids and, and we went to PWIs, right? Are, are, are we looking at things differently just because times are different? People are throwing things in our faces that it's like, you know, when we were in school, it just made sense to go to UT or, you know, but now, and, and so I think that's why these questions are being presented now. These are individuals that went to UT with us. There was never no question about that, but now, go ahead, Shaniqua. I, I see you, I see you. Oh. I, I, I just totally disagree with that. <laughs> Nothing has changed. The first time I was called the N-word was on UT's campus, right in front of Dobie. Nothing has changed. I just made a conscious choice because UT paid me to go. Best decision of my life because of the people that I met and the network that I came out of UT with. But I think I would have had an equally stellar education at Howard, at Spelman, at um, Hampton University, any other school that I would have gone to. I, I just reject that times have changed so much that it's pulled the lens back from us. But we also have a different question within the Q&A, but that's why I was shaking my head. Um, within the Q&A, Bella Spite asks, do you think an athletic sit-out is a possibility? Would it be potent, excuse me, would it be potent? And also, is it fair to put that responsibility on student athletes? I think, um, I think that's the best question. Is it fair, right? Uh, we asked earlier, what is the role of the black athlete? Is, there, is it the responsibility of them to be the activists? Uh, I think we could ask that question about uh, even the professional ranks, right? right. Uh, with Colin Kaepernick kneeled and, and everybody wants them to boycott and, and give up their 10 to $12 million a year salaries as if they can walk into another job and claim that exact check. It's an unfair ask. Uh, and you're never going to get everyone to line up to do that because everyone's wagering something different. O tells a story of his mom working two jobs, one being at McDonald's, and him having to contribute financially to the household. You're not gonna, you're gonna have a hard time probably convincing someone who has a similar story to walk away from the very thing that they believe gives them an opportunity to step out of that, that hole. Mm -hmm. Agree. Anyone else? No one else? <laughs> Y'all like, I'm touching that. For a minute. Okay, I, I'm looking on Facebook to see um, if there are any other questions via Facebook. If not, I, I do have something that uh, I'd like to bring up, Shaniqua. I know oh, we're, we're closing in, and um, if you locate another question, but uh, uh, something that, you know, I know Ivan and I have talked about in the past, um, pretty recently, um, so the student athlete, right? So you have individuals who perhaps don't finish, finish their degree program because their um, athletic ability carries them on to where they're able to be drafted. You know, they can move on pretty quickly without completing their degree program, right? They're drafted into the uh, NBA, NFL, whatever the case may be. Okay, 
Um, and then they, you know, obviously with a lot of accolades from AT, I mean, from UT before, you know, moving on to the next level. Um, then they move on to the next level, you know, succeed there in their, their career there. And then they want to come back to UT and get their degree. Right. So I've seen a lot of individuals, a lot of my friends who, I mean, good on their part because now they're 30 years old. I mean, who wants to come back to school at 30, right? And, and get their degree, but they do, you know, they're coming back, they're getting a degree, but that's all they're getting is their degree. It's almost like mm. they've forgotten who they were 15 years prior, right? So all of that support that they had rallied behind them and they were bringing in the championships and all that stuff. Now it's like, yeah, 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 you know, okay, we got you with your degree, but there's nothing else to, hey, let me hook you up with this alum because, you know, your degree is in this subsector and then maybe this alum gives you a position here or that you're like there, there's no there's nothing for those individuals who are coming back to get their degree and really try to move forward once they're aged um and so i just kind of want to know you know is that something that i'm just saying and maybe that's not truly what it is or you know what are your thoughts about that and and because I, I think it's truly an, an injustice but let me know your thoughts. Um, anyone want to jump in on that? Alonda was about to speak. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, um, I wouldn't say that that's the case across the board. Maybe those are some um, unique instances, but I've seen examples where, where athletes have come back after um, completing their professional career um, and meeting with different counselors in um, the academic area and getting the help that they need to finish their degree. So I, I wouldn't say that that's consistent across the board that the athletes aren't getting their support afterwards. And I'm, um, I mean, I also go back on campus and meet with current student athletes and give them career advice and recruiting and all of that and invest in them in that way. But I, when I've gone back, I've seen some, some student athletes or some former student athletes who finished their professional career and actually in study hall, meeting with counselors and getting the, the support that they need to finish up. So I haven't seen um, personally any uh, former student athletes being neglected in that way, but I think it goes along a lines of, it's, it's twofold responsibility. Like um, I believe Anessa mentioned before and we were talking about um, also making sure the universities in place have those resources available for current student athletes and after graduating, if they were to um, leave early for professional um, reasons and come back, what resources are available or in place. Okay. And then also the student athletes responsibility to make sure that you are building relationships while you're there, building advocates while you're there. So once you are um, out of the sport and you graduate and you leave, you have someone to come back to as a resource. Um, so making sure that you're building those relationships and really forward thinking while you're a current student athlete. So it's twofold. The responsibility on the, the academic um, and career department for um, athletics is also the student athlete's responsibility also. Thank you. The only other thing I was going to add there, and uh, I agree, is also, I think, and this might be stereotypical, but I think it also uh, de depends on the sports and gender plays a role in that, right? Because if you think about traditionally the sports that people are leaving or graduating in two to three years, four years max, and they have a opportunity to go play professionally, typically those are more the traditional sports and males play those sports and they have lucrative amounts of money that they can either pass up at that moment in time or not. So I do think we should acknowledge there's a like a, a gender thing that's happening there. And, and without being too stereotypical, I think and I can only speak from my experience at the time when I was there, you definitely felt like in women's athletics that it was very clear that you are a student and you're an athlete. And um, the expectation was that you were going to graduate. And the expectation was you're going to graduate, whether that was four or five years, and, and then you would come back. So I think I saw a lot more people uh, finishing their careers or getting their degrees within that time frame and not even having to come back to the university to do so. I do know people who were males who uh, did go off and play professionally in different sports. And then it, it, I, I wouldn't want to put a percentage on it, but 
by far, I think there was less people who did not come back of the people that I know in my small sample than those who did actually come back to um, to get their degrees. But I do think that's where personal responsibility comes in, in my opinion, of like, if you enter this contract with this organization, and if the goal is for you to play four years, your goal should also be to get that degree at, at any point in that contract. I mean, that's the part you're, you're signing the contract on and however many years it takes to do that, I think you gotta make sure you own, you, you hold that institution responsible to ensure you do that. Very good. Right. So, so give me, give me Shaniqua, we, we have more questions or can I add on to that? We have more questions. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> huh? Go ahead, because your question well, is Well, <laughs> you know, we, we talked about, we talked about exploiting the, the athlete, right? Um, and, and so even now, some of those athletes that are returning, they are benefiting from the exploitation. Because a few years back, the NCAA says you have to graduate X number of athletes or you start to lose some of your scholarships. So immediately what the university did was kick the doors open to invite all those athletes who were hanging right outside of graduation, invited them back in, pay for them to complete that graduation, and therefore putting themselves in a better position, right, mm -hmm. uh, going, going forward. But to, to, to continue to help the athlete, um, post-collegiate career, there has to be real networking opportunities. Again, we talk about the intended bubble. We talk about the uh, the fortress that is, is built around you. Oh, Big O told a story that when he was recruited, he was told a story of what was there, right? They dangle a carrot of the UT network, uh, but none, none of us can really grab it, right? Sometimes created for a lot of these athletes. And so I think the university uh, and, and maybe a lot of universities have to do a better job of, of creating these, these, these substantive um, networking opportunities. Okay. Because at some point, your coaches and your counselors and all of those guys move on. They find other jobs at different universities. You're coming back to an empty shell of familiarity. I have, I'm sorry. I, have, I have two more questions. Um, and both of them actually play into the same side uh, with this current discussion. Um, is the question for athletes to strive more for the degree or for the play? It seems that even non-athlete graduates are not even guaranteed the high dollar, only the extra look that may, um, that may lead to the opportunity. So I'm assuming I'm kind of reading into this question. So is, is it people are coming to, athletes are going to schools, especially for instance, football or basketball. Is it truly to pursue a degree or is it truly to pursue an opportunity to go to the pros? Um, I, listen, I think <laughs> when, you, when you're talking specifically football and basketball, I think um, every athlete that, that's being recruited, that has the opportunity, that has the talent to come to a University of Texas, believes that they are next level material. Okay. Right? And so it, there's always going to be that outside hope that you are able to showcase what you're what you're uh, capable of and then that leads into a a high dollar uh, opportunity now some students will be more realistic as the years uh pass them by and, and and start to see what what is really out in front of them and some never were some touch the campus with professional or bust right um <laughs> and, and and some will adjust as they go but to to pretend that Myself, probably Nick, probably Octavius. I'm not sure. We talk about gender. I'm not sure if Shalando or Vanessa came to the campus with the with the same kind of mindset. But to I feel I I know that when I got to college, I felt like I was next level opportunity. Right? I, I felt like I you know I just did some things at the high school level and and here I come. Right? Uh, four years and I'm 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 cashing big checks. Uh, but along the way, reality sits in and you're able to size yourself up against what it really takes to be uh, that top 1%. Anyone else? Yeah, that, that, that allure um, is definitely there, right? I mean, I, I come from a, a rural part of, uh, of Texas, East Texas in specific. And the thing that was on my mind was, um, you know, doing my three to four years and, and, and making this money. That's really, you, you, if, if you told me coming out of high school that I wasn't going to be playing on Sundays and, and making a lot of money, we probably would have had a, a, a fight, you know? Um, and so that was the allure. Um, I, I would always consider myself, you know, 
maybe you know not the top of my class but definitely not at the bottom probably somewhere probably somewhere in between the middle and the top um but in terms of academics um but i made a promise to my mother uh and my family that I, that i get that taken care of the thing is is that <clears throat> um the but but you know being a first generation i think that the, being a first generation college student as well too there's a lot of things that we don't know especially when it comes to um african americans and so um i think as 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 Shalanda, uh, mentioned it is a responsibility for us but then i think it's also uh, a great responsibility for the university to ensure um uh, of, a, of a full cycle of, of service to the student athlete. Because I can give you an example of when it comes to the level of support, um, when it comes to coaching us uh, on the football side, when it came to coaching us and making sure that, you know, we were prepped for Saturday and to be able to have the product out there on the field and make sure that, you know, we do well, that same energy um, was not given on uh, the developmental side in terms of life skills. Sometimes we can't assume that individuals are gonna come in just automatically know, hey, okay, I need to go here. I need to apply myself. I need to, you know, we need, the, especially when you think about the, um, the the transformation from going from a teenager to a, a young adult, right? So there's still a, a high, high mature, a maturation phase that needs to happen. And so, uh, in, ter in terms of other sports, even when I went to Belmont and saw how y'all's academic uh, structure was set up, it was vastly different than what it was like Moncrief. I was like, whoa. I said, man, y'all got private, y'all got this, y'all got that. Like, it was different um, in terms of that. And so maybe that was where some more of that nurturing came in to, to, to an effect. And I'm not making an excuse. I'm just telling you exactly how it was on the football side. Um, and I feel like that was a modified or maybe even an abbreviated uh, approach to fully nurturing us, fully having someone there in terms of personal development, life skills to sit here and say, no, we're going to do this, you know, um, and, and that type of, you know, and it's not easy with a teenager, you know, or someone who has a, who has a mind that, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to get paid millions of dollars, you know, whatnot. Some will, some won't. That's just, that's just the reality of it. But uh, yeah, long answer. But that those are those are that's some of my two cents on that. Okay, Absolutely. and I appreciate that. there's one more question, and Tamika has told me that this will be the last question at this point. <laughs> so we we knew this was going to be a longer discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what's the best way to communicate to others that Black students aspire to be something other than a professional athlete? Um, as you all have lived through it. You know the pressure. They may not be able to be as vocal, but what are some of the ways that they actually can convey that, that, hey, we desire to be something even other than a professional athlete? Who, 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 who are we talking to? I, I, who are we trying to reach? <laughs> I can't answer well, that. Who's the audience? Yeah, <laughs> who, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, anyone want to take a stab at it? It just says, "What's the best way to communicate to others that Black students aspire to be something other than a professional athlete?" And perhaps the audience could be going into your opening statement, um, Ivan. You know, shut up and dribble. This is what you're supposed to do. Um, mm -hmm. If that mentality is there, then how can they actively? Um, communicate to others that I'm something more than uh, someone who can pass a ball, can dribble a ball, to, to do whatever that may be. I believe um, uh, Shalana says something really important uh, about advocacy mm -hmm. and advocacy. Uh, Nick, so Nick Redwine talked about maturation. Well, the human brain is not fully developed after the age of 25. So if the human brain is not fully developed, then we have a pretty, I was, pretty immature person. I call them babies with muscles. That's what we have. And so at the end of the day, um, it is the educators, it's the, uh, the, the staff, uh, placing people in position who relate with the children or who are able to actually be advocates, uh, to actually uh, really be able to promote this person properly. Um, the University of Texas uh, 
wants us to brandish the colors and brandish the, the, the Longhorn. But on the flip side, I think we can do a better job of promoting and advocating for our student athletes, which means telling stories deeper uh, than, than just what you see on a football field. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 45 years old. There are things that people are just now learning about my story because I'm just now being able to articulate. And at the end of the day, I'm at a university. They should be able to help me do that. And when they do that, they show me that they care about me um, yeah. and that I am be- more, more than football. I believe it is the University of Texas and other universities. I believe it's their job to help the community and everybody else understand that these are more than just football players or basketball players or someone in track or, or, or women's bas- uh, uh, basketball or whatever, whatever sport it is. Uh, we are more than athletes. We've always been more than athletes. Yeah. Uh, but but um, th- I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying they don't have responsibilities and that they shouldn't take those, but they're, but they're, they're young people, right? They're young people. And they're still trying to find their way. And so it's important for us to advocate uh, for them as professionals. Yeah. No, I agree. Oh, oh, I think someone said it in the chat, and I think that's what I was going to go to. Simply, I think once you get to college, it absolutely is a university's opportunity to dimensionalize these athletes. So they, they're known for something else outside their sport. And then I would actually argue or um, influence parents, coaches, uh, mentors, church leaders, anyone who has a young athlete in their life as they're building and develop this young person, they should be able to be developed in other ways outside of athletics. I think that is as much as these athletes are super conscious. I think the, the opposite of sport right now is there's a specialization of sport that happens at such a young age. And these kids start traveling on planes at eight and nine, starting to play basketball across the country. And they start to define themselves as basketball players and everyone gets along with that. So I, I, I would actually challenge everybody else in their community and their unit to make sure that they're not just growing as an athlete, they're growing as a person first because when their sport is over, that's what they're gonna have to fall back on, those skill sets and what they develop. And so I think it is, it's everyone outside of just the athlete who has to make sure and understand that and, and provide that awareness. Takes a village. It does. I was going to I was going to say something along the same lines that it's up to the people that are that are around the young athletes as they're growing maturing to instill that in them because like like he said that sometimes they're still trying to figure out who they are when they're entering the college and it's hard if you're entering in and you don't know that you're more than an athlete which I that's sad when I hear athletes say that that they that they don't know who they are outside of their sport and what they do. And so it's important as early on in a young athlete's life to help them know the value that they bring and who they are and their identity outside of what they do. That is so important. And that's why sometimes when athletes, um, they decide to retire, they're finished with the sport, sometimes they don't know what to do or they don't know who they are because they didn't take the time to learn that as they were maturing and growing. So self-identity and self-awareness um, is so important and the, the environment around young athletes instilling that into them, the value that they add and who they are outside of their sport is critical. Absolutely. If you want to show yourself to be more than an athlete, then show yourself to be more than an athlete. Mm-hmm. Right? It's that simple. Very good. Guys, we, we, we thank you so much. I mean, obviously we could go on and on and on, um, but Tamika has appeared. <laughs> that you know we, we should be wrapping up but um again an amazing conversation i think something we discussed during our pre-meeting is that we're not done um we opened this up as our last scheduled webinar um but as we've been doing this with this being number four we realize there's a lot of work still to be done and obviously there's a lot of people who are willing to connect with us as we connect with you guys and form new relationships and bonds that we would have never done, you know, if it had not been for this. So um, with that being said, I'll, uh, Shaniqua, unless you have something else to say, we'll turn it over to, to Tamika to close out. Oh, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Sorry. Um, so I'm Tamika Sadler, National President of Black Ex-Students of Texas. We call ourselves BEST. And um, BEST has chapters in Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, and Galveston County. 
Over the last 20 years, we've given out more than $60,000 in scholarships to black students attending UT Austin. As mentioned before in the webinar, the student athlete and students sometimes, um, we just didn't run in the same social circle. And um, I want to thank all of the panelists because you participated because we asked. And you didn't know that much about us. So thank you to Ivan, Shawanda, Vanessa, um, Dr. Bishop, and Nick for agreeing to participate in this panel. We tried a new type of webinar tonight, and we had difficulties. So I apologize for those who had difficulty getting in and for the um, Facebook Live. Uh, because of COVID, Beth most likely will not have in-person events this year, and we've had to expand our reach and connect to the black alumni in a, in a different way. I want to thank Shaniqua and Evelyn for contacting me with this great idea about the webinar. Um, I also want to thank Timothy Bailey. He's the former president of Beth Austin. He's now moved to Dallas. And he's, he's become like our IT guy. Um, Thank you. Hey, Timothy. Um, I feel so old because I just, we just were having, I was having problems. So Timothy came in, he saved us, actually me today. So thank you to everyone who's attended at least one of the webinars. And if you have any suggestions or want to be a panelist, please reach out to us. For those who have not joined the Facebook Best Group, please do so. We also have Instagram pages under Best National, Best Dallas, and Best Houston. Thank you again to our panelists. I look forward to us, all black alums, forming relationships and friendships. This is a movement and, and not a moment. Hook